morning and welcome in Jesus' name to our service today. Glad that you're here. If you're visiting, we offer a special welcome to you. We pray the Lord will encourage you and strengthen you as you worship with us. Those of you watching online, we welcome you as well. Pray that God will bless you as you worship with us today. Psalm 40 is our call to worship. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for your power to bring us out of the miry clay to set our feet upon a solid foundation and to give us a new song to sing. So, Father, as we come to worship you this morning, we are grateful for the privilege we have to know you, to fellowship with you, to gather with others who love you as well. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that our worship today would be pleasing in your sight. We pray that our worship would be in spirit and in truth, and that you would receive all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. As we come to worship this morning, I hope that we, as we're preparing our hearts, uh, have an understanding of the glory of God, the authority of God, and how worthy he is of our praise and how unworthy we are. I invite you to stand as we begin to worship this morning.
come to worship a holy God because of Jesus, and we come then confessing our need for his forgiveness. Psalm 51 is our confession of sin. Would you join with me as we confess together? Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sin. Thank you for the lamb that was slain, the one who purchased us from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come and worship you this morning. You are worthy of our praise. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2, reading verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Would you stand in reverence for God's word? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearances of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you join me as we confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
so much, Nate. In Christ alone, our hope is found. I was reminded this week of some uh, passages in Scripture, specifically in John, where Jesus was explaining to the disciples um, kind of some parables and things, because he had been preaching his whole earthly ministry, and the disciples were still a little bit confused, and he had talked about the parables, and, and finally the disciples said, we see clearly now. We understand this, and Jesus was sending them out, um, and then he said this, in John 16, he says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I invite you to stand as we continue to worship.
sin and death and the grave itself. As we bow before the Lord this morning, I pray that we would ask him to speak to us through his word. Will stand. 
to us this morning. Thank you for the authority of your word, for the truth of your word. May we use it to guide us in our everyday lives, Lord, until that day when you come again and call us to yourself. Pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. We turn this morning to Luke chapter 20. We read verses 1 through 19, living under God's authority. We've heard much about that already as we have read from Scripture, as we have sung. And we bow today, I trust, willingly, lovingly, under God's authority. Luke chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. And one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke to him, saying, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is the one who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? They reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death. They are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine grower so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they said, May it never be. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected. This became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Father in heaven, would you take now the words that we have just read, the words that are inspired by your Holy Spirit for our instruction, that teach us, we pray, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations in our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. There are many people who enter politics with good intentions. They believe that they've been elected to serve the people who put them in office, and some of them do it well. And we thank God for those who do it well. But with others, it seems as if authority has a way of somehow changing them. When they get a little taste of power, a little taste of authority, many just don't want to give it up. And anyone who wants to remove them from office is going to pay a price for it. Would you agree? <laughs> wow, in our culture today, it seems like that is, is so clear. And this is what we see in the text that we just read with the Jewish religious leaders. They saw Jesus as a threat to them, a threat to their authority 
and they were determined to do whatever it takes to get Jesus out of the way. Notice, first of all, the Lord's rebuke of those who question his authority. So we find Jesus teaching and preaching in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes then come and they confront him. And they ask him this question. He said, tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who is the one who gave you this authority? Now, what are these things that they're talking about that Jesus was doing? They were the things that had just taken place a few days before this. Part of that was Palm Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem And they cried out to him, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus went into the temple. Remember what he did? He overthrew the tables of the money changers, took a whip and said, get out of here. And to top it off, Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. Would you say that Jesus upset their apple cart, right? (laughs) They were not happy with what Jesus was doing here, and they were wondering, "Where, where did you get this authority? Who in the world do you think you are? Do you think that you can just do whatever you want in the temple without getting permission? That's what they were concerned about. Who said you could do this? Was it the high priest? Was it the Sanhedrin? Who in the world gave you the authority to do these things? John MacArthur says that Jesus presumed to assault the temple operations without regard for the Jewish authorities shocked and outraged them. From their perspective, it was bad enough that he physically disrupted their lucrative business operations that he did so without first seeking permission from the Jewish hierarchy, made the Lord's actions all the more intolerable and outrageous. He ignored the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin, the high priests, the chief priests, the rabbis, the scribes, and the temple police. How dare him do that? Who in the world does he think he is that he can just go into the temple and start preaching and throwing tables over without permission? That was the crux of their concern. Now, let me ask you, did Jesus have authority to do these things in the temple? Of course he did, right? The temple didn't belong to the religious leaders, The temple belonged to him. And he had just told them that in chapter 19 of Luke, right before this, when he overthrew the tables there, Jesus entered the temple, verse 45, began to drive out those who were selling. And then he quoted scripture. It is written, he said, my house, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a robber's den. Whose house was it? Not the religious leader's house. Jesus said, this is my house. And not in my house will you do what you're doing. And I have every authority to come into the temple and proclaim the word of God. Now, does Jesus have that kind of authority today? Does he have the right to say what goes on in the temple? This is the question that we need to ask because we who are believers in Jesus are his temple, are we not? We are collectively, as a body, we are his temple. Ephesians 2 verse 19, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, 
in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So if you know Jesus, you are part of the body of Christ and we collectively are his temple. Does he have a right to do with us whatever he desires to do? Absolutely. He is in authority over us. And the same is true with us individually. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Wow, does that fly in the face of culture today? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So, when it comes to our lives as believers, both as a congregation and as individuals, we are under his authority, are we not? And he has every right to do with us as he desires, and he does not need to ask anyone's permission. We stand under the authority of God. Now the question that the religious leaders asked Jesus about his authority was a question that really didn't need to be asked. They knew the answer already because Jesus had made it clear on many occasions where his authority comes from. Matthew 11, 27, he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. John 3, verse 35, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So the question about Jesus' authority wasn't really an honest question. They knew the answer. But they were trying to trap Jesus. They were hoping that Jesus would be forced to admit that he hadn't gotten any approval, hadn't gone to the Sanhedrin or the chief priest or the high priest, hadn't gotten any approval to do this in the temple, and he would be discredited then in the eyes of the people. But notice how Jesus answers their question by asking a question. That was common among the rabbis of that day. When they were asked a question, they would respond by asking another question. And so that was very common. And so verse 3, Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you a question, and you tell me. And the question he asked, verse 4, was the baptism of John from heaven or from heaven? Now, these men thought that they were the knowledgeable theologians of the day, right? You had a question, you go ask them, they had the answer, they were the theological brains of the day. They were no match for Jesus. In fact, the question that Jesus asked put them in a trap. It put them in a dilemma that they could not escape. And so they're reasoning together, okay, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? They said, if we say from heaven, what's Jesus going to say? Well, why didn't you believe it then? Or if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. And so they said, we don't know. Now that was humbling. These theological superstars, you know, asked a question. We don't know. We just don't know. So Jesus was making it clear to these men what their problem was. They questioned his authority because they did not want to be under his authority, right? That's the problem. They didn't want him to tell them what to do. And that is the problem, isn't it, with human nature? We do not want to be under authority because we want to decide what we want to do, no one else telling us what to do, and many people will not even bow under the authority of Jesus. They 
want their own way. They want to do their own thing. You know why people question the authority of the Bible today? It's for the very same reason. They do not want to bow under the authority of the Word of God. And so they disregard it. They question the authority of Scripture. The issue is the heart, right? I want my way. I want to do my thing. Who do you think you are to tell me how to live my life? Notice, secondly, and this is really amazing, the Lord's patience with those who resist his authority. So after silencing the religious leaders who question his authority, Jesus tells them this parable about this man who planted a vineyard and then he rented it out to the vine growers. And since the Old Testament often described the people of Israel as a vineyard that God had planted, it was an illustration that they would have easily understood. You see, God had put the religious leaders in charge of the vineyard. And they were supposed to lead in such a way that the nation brought forth fruit for the Lord. But these leaders became self-serving. They began to view the vineyard as if it was theirs. and They resisted God's authority over them. And so that's illustrated when the owner of the vineyard sent his representatives to receive some of the produce. So in verse 10, he sends a slave. They beat him, sent him home empty-handed. Verse 11, he sends another slave. They beat him, treat him shamefully, send him away empty-handed. Verse 12, he sends a third slave, and they wounded him and cast him out. So finally, he says... I'll send my son. Maybe they will respect him. Verse 14, But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So no matter who the owner sent, the vine growers refused to accept him. Now, I'm not surprised by the response of the vine growers. They illustrate the truth that our hearts are evil. We do not want to be under authority, resist God's authority, because we want our own way. That does not surprise me when you look at how they treated the owner of the vineyard. What does surprise me and what amazes me is the patience of the vineyard owner. Kip kept sending his representatives. They kept beating them, sending them back empty-handed, beating them, beating them, until finally, I'll send my son. And what do they do with him? They kill him. They kill him. Now, most vineyard owners would have never been this patient. After the first slave was beaten and sent home empty-handed, they would likely have responded with quick retribution. But this vineyard owner was patient, and those who were listening to this parable would likely have been shocked. Why on earth would this owner of the vineyard continue sending slave after slave after slave? They were beaten. And finally his son, and they killed him. They would have wondered how the vineyard owner could have been so patient when he was treated so poorly. Now, it's obvious that the vineyard owner is a picture of how God dealt with the people of Israel. God sent prophets to them over and over and over and over and over again. What did they do? They did exactly what was done in this parable. 
Remember Stephen, when he was preaching that sermon before the Sanhedrin, he said, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Not a single one. They were all treated in the same way. And yet, God continued to send them over and over. Why? Scripture tells us why. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 15 says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwellings. That's why God continued to send prophet after prophet after prophet because he loved them. He wanted them to turn to him. He was gracious and patient and loving to those who had rejected him over and over again. After the first few prophets, what would you have done? I think I would have said, find them. You have no concern for me. I have no concern for you. But he didn't. He had compassion on those who resisted his authority, even to the point of sending his son, Jesus. Kent Hughes says, this parable is rooted in God's great love. In the face of Israel's hard-heartedness, he persisted and persisted and persisted. Martin Luther once said, if I were God and the world had treated me as it treated him, I would kick the wretched thing to pieces. (laughs) If you've never read any Luther, there's a good vintage Luther quote. If they had done that to me, I'd have kicked it right to pieces. But instead... Instead of turning his back on the world, God continued sending servant after servant. Why? Because of his compassion. Has God been patient with you? Think of it. Has he persistently sent his messengers to you when you resisted him? How many would say, yeah, And I'm grateful for that. That God would not give up on me when I pushed him away, when I resisted his authority in my life. He continued to send his word to me because he cared for me. It's quite amazing, isn't it? 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise. As some count, slowness, but is patient towards you. Why? Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Boy, we can rejoice today in the patience of God. If he were not patient with us, where would we be? It's amazing, isn't it? patient and compassionate God is. Notice the third thing we see in this passage. The Lord's judgment upon those who continue to reject his authority. Although the Lord patiently waits for people to repent of their sins, if they continue to refuse, there comes a time when judgment is inevitable. And this is what we see in the parable that Jesus told. After the vine growers had repeatedly rejected the slaves and finally killing his son, something had to be done. Verse 13, the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine saw him, they reasoned with one another saying, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and and this inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then Jesus says, what then 
will the owner of the vineyard do to them? After they had rejected all of these messengers, after they had killed his son, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16 says, he will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. In other words, the just response of the owner was to put an end to the vine growers and give the vine, the vineyard to others. Now, here's where it's interesting to compare the different gospel accounts of the same parable. Because in Matthew's account, if you look at his account of this parable, you will notice that this is the conclusion that Jesus' audience came to before Jesus even stated it. Conclusion in verse 16. He'll destroy him, give the vineyard to others. Matthew 21, verse 40. Therefore... When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, so this is their response that came first. They said, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. They got They got involved in this story, right? And they're hearing what's going on. Jesus said, what should be done to them? These wretches should be brought to a wretched end. And they brought judgment upon themselves with their own statement, right? They saw how wrong it was to treat the owner of the vineyard in this way. But then it finally dawned on them that Jesus was applying this parable to them. (laughs) And then they changed their tune. Because verse 16 says, when they heard it, they said, may it never be. You think this is going to happen to us? Yeah, this is a nice story. Yeah, those people should come to a wretched end. But if you're applying this to us, if you think that we're going to be judged, we're the leaders, you think that's going to happen? Never. May this never be. But Jesus looked at them in verse 17. And he said, what then is this that is written? And he quotes from the scripture. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. As if to say, haven't you read this? What does this mean then? And then in verse 18, Jesus said, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whoever, on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. What's he saying? You reject the chief cornerstone, you reject Jesus, you reject me, what's the result? Well, there was a partial fulfillment of what Jesus said here in in, uh, 70 AD, right? When the Romans came in and they wiped out the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And Jesus had warned them, hadn't he? Luke 19, verse 43, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What's Jesus saying? He's saying that through his ministry, God was visiting his people. God in human flesh was speaking this parable to them. He was preaching in the temple. He was healing the sick. And Jesus said, you didn't get it. You missed it. You were looking for a different Messiah, and so you rejected him. And judgment came. Jesus' words will reach their ultimate 
fulfillment on the day of judgment. And those who reject him will be judged eternally. Jesus pictures it as being broken to pieces and scattered like dust. He was warning them, wasn't he? He was warning them that if they did not repent of their sins, judgment will come. You can be sure of it. Now, did the religious leaders get the message? Yes and no, right? They understood that the parable that Jesus told was a parable that he was applying to them. They got that point. But they were so angry at Jesus that they wished they could have killed him right on the spot. Verse 19 says, The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay, to lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to tell me that I will be judged? Who are you to tell me that this temple is going to be destroyed, and that we're going to be gone and you're going to give the vineyard to someone else? So let me ask you as we conclude today, are you willing to bow before the authority of Jesus? Are you willing to acknowledge that he is your master? He is your Lord? And that you are willing to be obedient to him? Instead of going your own way, saying, Lord, I bow before you. I bow at your feet. Did you know that one day, every person who ever walked the face of this earth will acknowledge the authority of Jesus? They will. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, which we read from this morning, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee. Of those who are in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But for some, for many, it's going to be too late because they've refused to repent, they've refused to acknowledge who Jesus is, and they will, st they will bow before him, not as Savior and Lord, but they will bow before him as their judge. And the good news is that we have the privilege today to bow before Jesus, to acknowledge our need for him, to come confessing our sin to him, putting our trust in him, and, and experiencing the joy of of, of salvation, the joy of no condemnation, the joy of fellowship with Jesus. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I urge you to bow at the feet of Jesus today. Don't resist his plan for your life. Don't resist him. Receive him as your Savior and Lord and you can look forward to the day when Jesus comes again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this clear word, clear reminder to us, O oh Lord, that we will stand before you. In fact, we will bow before you, acknowledging that you, Lord Jesus, are Lord and Master. May it be today, Lord, that we bow before you, that we acknowledge our need for you, that we acknowledge your authority over us, and that we would be willing to say, Lord Jesus, where you 
Lead me, I'll follow. What you call me to do, I will do. As I acknowledge, Lord, your authority over my life. These things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. You stand as we sing our closing hymn. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.